Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to all of you who are taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, before we get started, um, I just have a little bit of Zoom housekeeping to review. Um, we are using the spotlight feature for today's conversation. So this uh, program may be best viewed in speaker mode. Um, also, we have David Jaden monitoring the chat function. So if you have questions during the program, please send them directly to David. And then we will reserve time at the end of the program after our conversation um, to review and answer those questions. Um, and I think that's it in terms of housekeeping. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our Dean and President, um, Alicia Bouleff, to say a few words. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is really exciting uh, for Albany Law School, the launch of the Women's Leadership Initiative. Uh, I want to start by thanking the, the leader of this um, and the person who's made that, this possible, Casey Patello de Cassard. Casey, uh, this is an initiative that's going to change lives. It is, uh, it's something that I've sort of, as, as a leader myself, um, I, I have thought um, long and hard about the talented students that we have, the talented graduates that we have, and how lucky I've been in my career to have just incredible mentors and, um, and the opportunity to learn about leadership and how we as, as women are able to come together and grow organizations and change the world. And uh, through your generosity, we're gonna be able to really uh, create programs and opportunities that, that are gonna make a difference in the lives of individuals and then in the world in general. And, and it is, um, I think for Albany Law School to be the, the home of a women's leadership initiative is something that makes us stronger and better. And so thank you. Um, and thank you to you all uh, who are here and, and part of this. I can't wait to see, the, wait to see this grow. I'm, I'm here to help in any way that I can. So that's my part. Thank you very much, Dean Moulet. It was very nice to hear from you. So to give everybody um, just a little bit of background, Casey, Kimberly, who, who allows us to call her Casey, um, graduated from Albany Law School in 2005. She graduated magna cum laude and was an executor, executive editor for the Albany Law Review. Currently a partner with the law firm of Cahill, Gordon, and Rindell in New York City, where she focuses on mergers and acquisitions. Casey, it's so lovely to have you here with us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much for, for letting me join you all today for this conversation, and thank you to the Dean and Mary and everyone else at Albany who has been incredibly supportive of this initiative. Um, we had lunch last summer up at the law school and um, I said, you know, I've been thinking about this thing and there's not a lot of law schools that do it. And I think that we could really do something like this. And here we are less than a year later um, having this conversation. So uh, I really appreciate the support and initiative and um, enthusiasm for this program, which I, I agree with the Dean that this is gonna be really an incredible opportunity for um, our students, our alumna, um, and everyone in the, in the Albany Law School community, whether they're Albany Law alum or not. Um, like Mary said, um, I graduated from Albany Law in 2005 um, and went and joined Cahill Gordon where I'm now a partner. Um, just by way of background, I grew up in Monroe, New York, um, which is downstate a little bit from Albany. And that's where I live now. Um, so I have a pretty hefty commute into New York City if and when we ever commute back into New York City. Um, I uh, went to Furman University undergrad, which is in Greenville, South Carolina. I played division one softball there. I was a catcher. 
Um, my husband, Sakis, and I um, have three children, uh, Dominic, who is almost six, um, and then twin girls, Natalie and Gigi, who are almost four. Um, and um, I also, I serve, in addition to serving on the board at Albany Law School, I'm on the board of, of their school, which is the Tuxedo Park School. Um, and I'm involved also with New York Presbyterian Hospital and serve on their um, Women's Council as well. So, um, you know, I, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled that this program is taking off and, um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to today's uh, conversation. And just, you know, at the outset, everything I say today is my own perspective. Um, it may or may not resonate with you. Um, and that's part of what this program is all about is that you know, having conversations and everybody offering their perspective, their experiences, um, and coming together as a community to share all of that so that, you know, we can collectively help ourselves, help others, help um, those that are coming behind us and graduating from Albany Law School. So, um, you know, I, you may or may not agree with some of the things that I say today, um, but I hope everyone um, comes to this conversation and all conversations kind of, um, assuming goodwill uh, and that the um, intentions are pure and good and we can have meaningful conversations about how to move things forward and make this a meaningful program for everybody in, in the community. So um, I remember the lunch that you came to um, a little bit less than a year ago now, I think, and um, how you had expressed at that lunch this idea um, I think you were just starting to form it. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts about your vision for this initiative and what success looks like to you. Yeah, so um, if you start at why, right? I think that's what, where you have to start is why. Why, why do this? Why is this important? Um, and that, that lunch that we had was right after I had done on-campus interviews. Um, and it just further solidified my desire to do something like this and, and determining that Albany was the right place to do it. Um, you know, the, the Albany Law women that I met on campus at those interviews blew me away. Um, they, they were superior in every respect, and I interview a lot of students from all schools in the country um, and the the women in particular that I met at Albany Law School were were second to none um, just kind of raw talent and so you know if you if you think about that and you think about well if I give this these people you know a little bit of sunshine and water like you would a plant um, and support they could really just knock it out of the park um, and really can flourish and from the time I, I can remember, um, my father has always said to me that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And so if there's a way to better prepare women um, coming out of Albany Law School for the opportunities, which is number two on my list, um, gosh, they could really just do amazing things out there and really change what the legal profession looks like in a meaningful way and really accomplish incredible things for themselves and the women that come behind them. And um, so it just, you know, I went from those interviews to the lunch and just said, we, you know, we kind of have to do this. Um, the second piece is, is opportunity. And so I've had this incredibly full and blessed life full of opportunities. Um, but I've also missed a lot of opportunities and a lot of chances and a lot of relationships that I didn't cultivate and that I, I didn't spend time on. And I want to help others make more opportunities for themselves. Um, I want this program to help people miss fewer opportunities. And if we can do that, if I can do that, if other people in this community can do that by offering time, perspective, resources, um, whatever it is, and bringing together a community of people who can do that, there's power in that, and that that's what's going to really drive change. Um, and then the, the last thing is of why um, is I, 
I hold my kids accountable. They're six, almost six and almost four. Um, so accountability at the six and four year old level is, is different. But at dinner, um, and their school model motto is be kind, fair and responsible. Um, at dinner most nights, I say to them, what did you do today? What did you do today that was kind, fair, responsible? How did you make the world, and their world is the bubble that we live in at our house, um, better? Did you share a toy? Did you give your sister a hug? Did you give your brother a hug? Whatever it is, what did you do today that was that made change in someone's life? Um, and then they ask it back to me. <laughs> and that's, you know, a, a real challenge some days. And so I have, I'm held accountable um, for, you know, what did you do? What did you do to help someone, something, change something? Um, and so this seemed like the right place to be. So success for me um, and, and what I hope success for, for most of us looks like uh, with respect to this initiative is um, this, right? If, if I switch to gallery view, which I'm not gonna do because I might not get back <laughs> to where I am, um, you know, there was 100, over 100 people signed up to, to talk today. And, to hear me talk, but I hope one day soon we'll be in a position where we can actually have a, a, you know, a conversation. Um, but there's 100 plus members of the community that are coming together to learn, share, connect. That's what life is about. I mean, that, and that's, that's what the practice of law is about. Um, if, if people can walk away from a program that we run here, um, walk away from a networking event, a training session, whatever it may be, and say, I met someone tonight who can help me, or I met someone who I can help, um, or I learned how to handle this situation better, or I learned how to better manage someone um, or help someone in their career. That's gonna be success. I mean, this is very grassroots in a way that it's not gonna be an event that symbolizes success. It's gonna be every single life that this program touches um, male, female, black, white, purple, green, um, you, LGBTQ, any religion, you name it. Um, I, I hope this program touches a lot of different lives and not just women, um, but everyone whose lives are touched by and impacted by women and we're all living in this together. So um, that's what success is gonna look like. It's gonna look um, it, it's going to look like changing and impacting each individual um, in some way through the programming that we're putting on, through the network events we're putting on, through the mentorship that's available, um, and just through the, the learning and sharing and connecting that I hope will go on in this program. I think that's Incredible, um, incredible goals, incredible vision, and um, your definition of success, I think couldn't be more meaningful, frankly. Um, I love the fact that you're talking about creating a seat at the table, essentially, right, for, for so many people. Um, so I'm just thinking a little bit about your background in corporate M&A, right? And that is a background that I consider, in my mind, I make this assumption, that it is primarily a background or an industry that men practice in. Um, were there certain challenges you faced um, getting into that area of practice? And how did you overcome them if there were? Yeah, so um, I, I grew up um, raised primarily by my father. Um, who is a white male. So, you know, I grew up um, with, and, 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 I, and I grew up with him telling me on an almost daily basis how awesome I was um, and how there was nothing I couldn't accomplish and how I was good as any man and that if I worked really, really hard that I would get whatever it is that I wanted to get, whatever goal I was trying to achieve. Um, and, so, you know, when you grow up that way, um, 
when you go out into a world um, that is dominated by white men, I kind of just incorrectly assumed um, that they were all going to be super supportive and all going to be like my dad and all going to be like, wow, you're awesome and there's nothing you can't do. And yeah, if you just work really, really hard, then you're going to get everything that you want in life. Um, and, and in part, that's true. Um, you know, if you look at my life now, I'm where exactly where I want to be. I'm doing exactly what I want to do. And I have this unbelievably rich and wonderful life. Um, but, you know, there were definitely obstacles along the way that I wasn't prepared for. Um, and I, I wish that I had had an opportunity to learn um, and to hear people's perspective and to learn how to handle those situations as I was learning to be a lawyer. Um, you know, there's so much more to the practice of law than law. Um, and that's what I hope this program will do in large part is, is train lawyers, um, people who've been doing this for a really long time and people who are just starting to do this. We all have something to learn. Um, how, how to be better lawyers and not just in our substantive areas, but how to, how to be better at managing lawyers um, and how to, um, how to support lawyers. And so, yeah, I mean, it, in M&A, there's almost no women. Um, there's, there's very, very few. Um, and, you know, I was in a meeting one time um, <laughs> where a, a the client on the other side um, actually made a he made a point and I disagreed with it because he was wrong quite frankly his lawyer admitted so after the fact um, and I said I'm not quite sure that I understand that point trying to be polite um, and try and make clear that he, he wasn't quite right and he, he said you know there's scientific evidence that women's brains don't function as quickly as men's um, as if I was not computing as quickly as I should have been and that he wasn't in fact wrong. Um, you know, I, I let it go at the time. Um, you know, we were in a big group meeting, but I, I think that if it were happened today, I, I might have reacted differently um, because I'm in a different spot, right? I'm, in a, I'm a partner now. Um, I'm established in my career, but, you know, I don't think that it would have been wrong for me to push back at that time um, and, and say, you know, I'm offended by what you just said to me and I'm a really good lawyer and I deserve to be here. And in fact, my point is the right one, go ask your lawyer. Um, you know, at the time I was afraid of coming across as offensive or inappropriate or mouthy or whatever other words that people sometimes use to describe women who are vocal and strong and opinionated. Um, but I, I feel differently now. Um, and I think I would have reacted differently had that happened to me today. Um, because you can't just sit by silently. That's just what's going to, it'll keep happening. Um, if, if people aren't, um, told that there is a better way and, and, um, to behave better and to behave more appropriately and to behave more fairly, quite frankly. Um, but and, and I'm not saying that this program is going to train women how to do that early in their career. It's, it's a hard thing to do, man or woman, um, to, to be vocal early in your career. But I do hope that um, people will have the opportunity through this program to get some training around implicit bias, around anti-harassment, around self-advocacy, around finding your own voice um, and how to be heard, um, how to develop business, which is different for men and women, um, how, to, how to manage and be supportive of women, um, people of color, marginalized groups, because that's different too. Um, and so I really hope that this program will help train people who are in a position um, like I am now, and also have people uh, who are coming up, the, the younger lawyers, who are going to be in situations that are uncomfortable and difficult for them to navigate. Um, one, hear that there are people out there who are thinking and talking about this, just knowing that 
we are acknowledging a problem or a shortcoming or an opportunity for change, I think is important to younger people coming up that, you know, we're not just all burying our heads in the sand and, and going on, um, but also how to navigate that. And, and even if they don't navigate it in the moment, which again is an incredibly thing, hard thing to do, um, maybe they'll have through this program, a network of people that they can then go and talk to and say, hey, this really crappy thing happened to me at work today. And I didn't say anything, um, but it made me feel this way. And I don't know, how should I, how should I have handled that? Or is there something I should do now? And just having an opportunity to talk about it with someone who you've connected with, who has a similar perspective or a background or an experience, um, I think is what we need. Um, I think it's what, what students need. I think it's what recent graduates need. I think it's what people in my position need. Um, you know, it's not, you, you keep growing and learning um, in life and in the profession of law. And I still have mentors and, and sponsors and people that I talk to and bounce ideas off of. And um, I, I was speaking to one the other day and, um, you know, I, we still have coaching and coaches and, you know, we're not perfect. We're all a work in progress. And I really hope that this program gives people the opportunity to figure out how to navigate and deal with all of that. Um, Cause all of this is critically, it, it's critical to the success of lawyers. Um, and again, it's not just about the substance and it's not just about female lawyers, um, but you know, we need to train ourselves. We need to have the vocabulary and tools to navigate it. Um, we need to train the people who are in a position to change it. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's hard out there um, for women um, in the law and in particular in m and But, you know, I, I, you gotta, I keep working. I work every day at it. Um, and hopefully we, uh, we can see some progress uh, in the numbers. And I think that starts with doing things like this. I agree. Um, you made me think of a couple of questions. First, I, I really wanna go back to your story about um, when you had to correct um, the other side's uh, lawyer. Did you have anyone that you could talk to about that experience? Did you have, at that point, a mentor or a champion or support? Yeah, I did. So, so in that room with me, I was the only woman in the room. Um, I, was a, um, um, I was a junior part. I was a partner, but I was a junior partner. I had a senior partner in the room with me. Um, uh, and I had a client who was very supportive. Um, and, you know, neither of them spoke up in the moment. Um, which I think is a, a bit telling, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I don't think it was because they were not supportive overall, but um, I think I, again, in hindsight, would have preferred um, had they been vocal in the moment, right? Um, that, that's what really would have been meaningful. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I, I was with um, a partner who has been my mentor and my sponsor for you know, as long as I can remember. And afterwards, he and our client um, were, were talking and calling that guy some choice names for a variety of reasons, including the fact that my brain works slower than his. Um, so I, I felt like I had an outlet and I had supporters. Um, but again, all of that's nice to have after the fact. Um, but what's, what creates meaningful change is when it happens in the moment. And I don't think anyone ever corrected that guy. I don't think anyone ever brought it up again. Um, his lawyer ultimately got him to agree that to, to my position and to my point, because it was the right place to be, but um, no one ever really circled back to that other than, you know, the people on our side of the table saying, God, that guy's a real jerk. Um, sorry that you had to hear that. But, you know, I'll take a sorry um, and, and I'll take an acknowledgement that he was wrong. Uh, but, but in the moment, I think would have produced some more meaningful change. Um, and it would have said to me, right, as a junior 
female lawyer, we really are supportive of you publicly out there, not just in private apologizing after the fact. And that's where I hope we can get to, um, not just through this program, but as society generally, um, that, that people are comfortable being vocal in the moment, holding people accountable and saying, and like I said at the outset, I'm going to assume goodwill, but what you said was offensive and, and not, you know, not appropriate. And so, you know, I would appreciate if, if you didn't say things like that and you acknowledge that, you know, I deserve to be here and what I'm saying is in fact correct. Right, right. It's so um, consistent with your goals of normalizing female success, right? Normalizing that process of speaking out in the moment and feeling safe to do it, right? Um, so, and one of the other things that you mentioned is that um, just in passing that business development is different for men and women. And I think that's so interesting, particularly in light of what we are learning about leadership um, and that empathetic leadership, which is most often demonstrated by women, is really a very successful um, model of leadership. So can you talk to us a little bit about what you meant in terms of business development being different and leadership, frankly, being different um, between men and women? Yeah, so business development um, is, is different. It's different for men and women. Um, it's different in the sense that, um, look, I, I grew up playing softball. I love going to a baseball game as much as anybody. Um, I enjoy playing golf. I'm a terrible golfer, but I enjoy it. Um, but when you think about business development in the law, it's a lot of that. It's a lot of baseball games and football games and golf um, and other things that um, you know a lot of women like to do. Uh, but, a, you know, a lot of both men and women don't like to do. And so it's hard um, when you are coming up in big law in particular, and I'm, you know, speaking from my own experience, where the opportunities to engage in a social way with clients are centered around um, drinking, going to baseball games or other sporting events or going golfing or, or, or doing things like that, that um, either aren't enjoyable to everybody or um, aren't comfortable for everybody. And, um, and so most of my male colleagues, that's what business development looks like to them. Business development to me looks very different, not because I don't enjoy those things, but um, in large part, I'm more time constrained um, than um, my male colleagues, and which we can circle back to in a moment. Um, and, and also, I, I think that business development, um, for me, what's been most successful for me um, is making real connections. And so when I meet someone, I am not thinking, gosh, when are they going to give me a piece of business? Um, and, that's my, and that's my goal. That's not my goal. I, I go to tons of networking events just to meet people. Uh, just to have conversation, hear their perspective, hear what's going out on in the market, go what, hear what's, hear what people are doing out there and what's been successful for them and, and what their business or their practice or whatever it is, is like. Um, we often talk about our kids. We talk about where we live, where we vacation. Um, we make a real connection. I, I would say I develop friendships and that for me has been wildly successful from a business development perspective because I'm developing a relationship, I'm developing trust, uh, I'm developing a friendship. And that naturally leads to people thinking about me if they need a lawyer um, or if their company is hiring somebody or whatever the case may be. And it may not be in my particular area, um, but maybe there's somebody at my firm who can help. And so, Developing a really deep connection and relationship and friendship uh, is how I approach business development, and it's been successful. When I when I talk to my male colleagues, they take a many times take a very different approach. Not that they're not trying to develop a relationship and a rapport, but they're not 
they typically don't make very deep connections and don't spend a lot of time cultivating and growing the relationships. Um, and so I think that it's important through this program um, to have people, you know, when we can, um, put people in a position to, to develop networks and develop relationships because you never know where it might lead. It might be five, 10, 15 years, you know, a long time. It's, it's the long play um, that before that comes back in, in any sort of business development way. But I think it's important to feel comfortable going into a room of people and saying, hi, I'm Casey. How are you? What do you do? Um, and, and getting them comfortable with developing relationships. And it's not natural for everyone. It, it wasn't natural for me initially. Uh, but over time and the more you do it and the more you see, Hey, you know, I'm meeting people and it may or may not turn into something, but she was interesting or he was interesting. And, um, you know, I, I think is, is what's important. And that's really, I think how business development ultimately works. I'll say that right now in, in the COVID era, women, uh, I feel are knocking it out of the park, uh, on business development in this weird and remote uh, way because it's very natural for many of us to pick up a phone um, and say, hey, just call in to see how you're doing um, because it's something that many of us do naturally all the time. Um, and so I've spoken, I, I spend my day talking and talking and talking um, to people just saying how they are um, and what's going on and um, you know, I'll say, if you need help with anything, give me a call, but that's not the purpose of my call. And so your point about empathy and making connections, I think is the right one. Um, and it's something that we need to cultivate and, and help people develop that muscle and that skill to feel comfortable um, reaching out to people and doing what kind of comes naturally uh, and, and developing those relationships, because that's what's going to sustain and you know, my, my male colleagues who spend a lot of time on the golf course um, or at baseball games can't do that right now. And so when I say, who'd you call today? Did you like, you know, are you reaching out to anybody? Yeah, but it's a little awkward. And, you know, we usually just are, you know, basic conversation on the golf course. It'd be a little weird for me to call and ask about his family. You know, that that's not the situation I'm in. And so I'm making a lot of deeper connections now in particular, and people appreciate the outreach. Right. Um, do you think it's also because women communicate differently naturally? Yeah, I do. Um, I do. I, I didn't believe a lot in the differences between, um, you know, how men and women are really different until I had a boy and then two girls and they are wildly different. Um, you know, my girls were born into a household that was full of trucks and trains, not, um, not because I thought boys should play with trucks and trains, but because my son gravitated towards trucks and trains. And um, my daughters were born into a house full of trucks and trains and um, are obsessed with baby dolls and princesses. Um, again, not because I drive them in that direction, just seems to have happened. Um, and so I think that there is a real difference between men and women. And I think the science probably supports that too. Um, but yeah, I, I just think that, that, there's a different approach. There's a different um, sense of sincerity and genuineness and empathy and connection um, that I think largely comes naturally, um, but it not always, but it, in either case, it requires work and, um, and a little bit of direction um, so that you're, you're making the right connections with the right people in the right way that will ultimately help you. And so um, I agree with you 100%. Um, and um, one of the things that you mentioned is that in this COVID-19 world, which is kind of crazy to think that when we first planned this, the, we were talking so much about COVID-19 and it, it seems like it's uh, something that, that is less important today. Um, but we had been discussing a little bit about the result of women being the primary caretaker oftentimes, and now on top of that, having to work from home. 
Um, do you see this as an equity issue? Um, I do. Uh, you know, I, I'll tell you just a little bit about my situation, which is different and, and better than most, I think, um, in terms of level of support right now. So I, I'm, we're all working remotely. Um, my husband has his own advisory firm, so his schedule is flexible. Um, my mother um, lives with us. Um, my father lives nearby and is here every day. Um, so, you know, we have more than man-to-man -man coverage as it relates to, um, to my children. And yet I block out time on my calendar every day to make sure that I'm the one who is helping my son with his Zoom classes and his homework and his other things. Um, not because we don't have others here who can help and who can do that, um, but just because I feel like I'm the one who should and be doing that and I want to be doing that. And that's hard um, to explain to my partners and, and others who say, but wait, isn't your husband available? Don't your parents, with, aren't they with you? Um, I don't understand, you, you have help, so why are you the one doing that? Uh, and, so I, I think that being in this environment right now um, has made it very obvious to a lot of people who um, didn't fully appreciate before what goes into managing a life and a career and that juggling act and that balancing act, although it's never ever in balance. Um, and so I think that what I hope will happen is a shift because when people say to me, but wait, you have plenty of help. Why are you doing that? Well, because I'm his mother and I have a sense of obligation and I think I'm the best suited to help him. And he seems to do best when I'm the one helping him. And um, yes, there's other people here, but I want to be involved, right? I, I want to go to the recital. I want to uh, be the class mom. I want to help. Um, and I want to be a part of this. And I think what we're seeing now, at least based anecdotally on conversations with my male colleagues, is that um, they're now in a position, one, to be home and seeing what their wives or spouses or significant others um, are doing and have been doing um, and how much work it is. And But I, I also think that they're seeing that they also want to be doing it. Um, and so I think that there is going to be a shift that comes out of this one where it becomes, um, you know, I hope more acceptable to work remotely um, because, you know, work isn't suffering. People are working efficient, efficiently and effectively. And so it can be done remotely without really missing a beat from a client perspective. Um, but also, um, you know, people want to be present and they want to be involved. And I think that even the, the older generation who has spent their entire career waking up, getting on a train, going into the office, um, they're now home and they're experiencing time with their significant others or their children or even their grandchildren in some circumstances. And they're finding, hey, I could kind of do both and I'm still working and I still am, you know, being successful and leading the firm or doing whatever their role is. But I'm also getting to spend all this incredible time with my family in a way that I wouldn't have gotten before. And I kind of like it. Um, and so I think that there, I hope that there is going to be, and I think that there will be a shift um, that perhaps makes it more equitable. Um, where, um, where, you know, the traditional roles um, and, and of men and women are kind of being turned upside down because everyone in a household is trying to just get by. And perhaps um, the men are doing more uh, and they're seeing that things need to change and they take that back to their institutions right? Um, and, and push change at their own institutions 
that make things um, more equitable. And I think that's what, what we, I hope, will happen, right? It can't just be the women. The women have been talking, we've, been, we've all been talking for a long time about how there needs to be a change and it needs to be more equitable and there needs to be um, a, a change so that, that it can be more manageable and we're not all hanging on by our fingernails on, at, at any moment of, at every given moment of the day. The change is gonna come when the men um, and the people who are in a position of, of power and who have, had, who have the most seats at the table see it um, and say, yeah, things need to change because it's not working the way that it was um, and, and drive that change. And, and I think that will happen. I hope it will. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more on, on so many of your points. I think that there's no such thing as balance. <laughs> you can hope for is integration. Um, and I also agree that the, the COVID um, outcome of working at home has sort of dismantled the idea of the perfect employee who keeps their, their home life in one compartment and their work life in another, right? And so by maybe supporting uh, choices of, of men to be more involved, we can also support women in the workplace. Yeah, I do think, I mean, you and I talked a little bit about this um, before. It's also going to take some work by women. Um, and I, I know when we were on the call before, um, I said that some of some of my my own um, lack of balance and exhaustion is self-created. And you kind of shuddered a little bit at the self-creation comment. Um, but, you know, it's we, we have to also um, force it, right? And, and I'll just, you know, very quickly, and just a quick anecdote about how I force change in my own household. Um, my husband said to me, did you pay, this was before COVID, did you pay the babysitter? Um, no, I didn't. Well, can you Venmo her? Well, I think you have the Venmo app on your phone. Um, and so I did not pay the babysitter. Apparently neither did he. Um, because the next time she came over, she said, you didn't pay me for last time. And I said, I thought you were going to Venmo her. And he said, oh, well, I asked you to. And I said, no, you asked me if I had. And I said, you have a Venmo app on your phone. Um, and so, you know, now he has the Venmo app. He knows how to function it. And he does, in fact, pay people. Um, but it it takes some of that, right? I could have very easily just paid the babysitter this and, and moved on and, and taken on that responsibility and kept doing that. Um, but it's going to take some of that as well, um, professionally, in the sense that, you know, I, you have to set boundaries and you have to say, no, I'm doing this. And again, that's, that's, I'm in a more comfortable position to say that I'm, I'm more senior, I'm a partner, et cetera. You know, I'm established in my career. So, and, and as a junior person, that's a very difficult thing to do. And I did not do that as a junior person. You know, I did, there are many things that I did not do that maybe I should have done um, to, to advance um, the goals of this program in particular that I didn't do, that I, I'm hopeful people will do and that people of my generation and so forth will continue to do. But, um, you know, it takes some of that. It takes some of the setting the boundaries, saying what the expectations are, um, asking for help, and and um, letting other people do some things um, and take ownership of some things rather than consistently saying, which is something that I do all the time, oh, it's just going to be faster to do it myself or I, I don't, you know, I'll just do it myself. And that constant saying of, I'll just do it myself, I'll just do it myself, um, is self-created, at least in my situation. Um, and it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help me. It doesn't help my junior associates. It doesn't help the advancement of anybody um, to take that position. And so that's something that I continue to struggle with. Um, and I think a lot of women in particular struggle with. Um, of, of just taking ownership and holding on to everything, both personally, professionally, at home, et cetera, that I think we need to, um, 
that we need to, to really work on because that's, that's also going to shift the balance um, of power and expectations and what is normal, normal. Um, right. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. I, I, it's real. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing your, your personal anecdote. I can think of several as well. Um, so, so just generally speaking, I've heard a lot of people say that this, that practicing law is at this, um, as a result of COVID is at this transformational stage. Have you found that with your practice? Is the practice of law forever changed? Um, I don't know if the, I don't know if it's forever changed. I think that at some point we will all go back to offices in some way. Um, but I think it's changed in the sense that um, the that people are realizing what matters to a practice, um, and that it's not just churning, it's not just hours, it's not just um, deal after deal after deal after deal, um, but that people are eager for and yearning connections, they're yearning learning, they're yearning um, finding that person who they trust, who they can talk to about thorny issues. Um, and so I think it's changed in that way and that the value of the relationship is becoming more important to people um, and, and increasingly valuable. And people are spending a lot more time on those relationships and shoring them up and spending time on them than they were before. Um, and, I, and I do think that there will be a shift to a remote work for a lot of people for a long time and that hopefully it will become somewhat normalized as much as it can be in a meaningful way. Um, so I think, I think it will be different. Um, the substance of it, um, you know, we're seeing changes now in terms of how contracts are drafted or um, what provisions are going in or coming out and how they're being interpreted and so forth. So there's a change there, but um, I don't know if that's a lasting change uh, or if we'll see some shift back post pandemic. But um, I do think how people are practicing law in terms of how they're thinking about what it means to be a lawyer and the value of their relationships is definitely changed. Okay, I'm gonna, I think we have time for me to ask you one last question and then I want to um, open up the conversation for questions. Um, who are your role models? Hmm. Um, so uh, I have a bunch. Um, you know, uh, my dad is probably, was, is, will always be the most influential person in my life. Um, he instilled in me a work ethic that, um, you know, is, is, has been incredibly rewarding and productive. Um, for me, he never expected, um, he, he accepted nothing less than the best. Um, mediocrity was not accepted in my house, but he didn't expect me to be perfect. All the time he expected me to do my best work and be my best self, um, whatever that looked like for me. Um, and that, all of that has been uh, incredibly valuable for me throughout my lifetime. Um, I, I have a, a former client, um, who turned mentor, turned friend, um, who has been very influential in my life. She, um, she is a Pakistani woman um, in um, an interracial marriage like myself. She has three kids um, who are older than mine, so um, I can kind of see where my life is headed. Um, she um, has navigated, she's worked in in an industry, she worked in the coal industry, which is um, predominantly white male. Um, and, you know, how she has managed to be successful and the things that she's managed to do in her career 
um, with grace and um, compassion and empathy and just unbelievable lawyering um, is, is an inspiration to me. She's an incredible friend. And so she's, she is definitely um, one of my role models, not just as a lawyer, but as um, a mother and um, just an overall good human being um, has been incredibly influential for me. Um, and, um, and, and my kids, um, which, you know, they're only six and four, but gosh, they are just um, really good people, pure yeah. and <laughs> kind and um, just, just wonderful. And so, you know, I do pretty much everything that I do for them um, and I work hard for them and I try to be good for them and a good human for them and um, do the right thing for them. And so, you know, if I could be more like them, um, certainly that would be, uh, um, that would be an accomplishment as far as I'm concerned. And I, and I hope they continue on this path um, and that they'll be my role models forever, uh, which I guess is part of my job too. So yeah. I would say uh, that those, that group of folks um, are, are very influential to me um, and have been role models. I love that. I love it. And I think children really do serve uh, the purpose of teaching us. Right? <laughs> they sure do bring a lot to light. So we, we have just one question here in the chat. Um, regarding uh, your thoughts that you should have raised your hand more as a junior partner and associate to advance women in their development. Um, do you think the fact that you didn't may and therefore didn't have the reputation of being someone who rippled waves was helpful to you. Um, and along the same lines, isn't it much easier said in hindsight, now that you're a partner, that you should, in other words, that you should have raised your hand more? And where is the happy medium? Yeah. Um, I don't know if, if I would have if, if not being a troublemaker um, or a wave rippler, um, I don't know. I don't know if that, that made a difference. Um, I'd like to think that it didn't, um, that ha had I spoken up, had I done more, had I spent more time training junior female lawyers, um, um, you know, doing anything more than just keeping my head down, doing my work and, and worrying about myself. Um, if that, if, if the outcome would have been different, if I had done something different, I'd like to think that I, I'm at a place in an institution that it wouldn't have, um, but I don't know. Uh, it, it's hard for me to say, uh, but it is something that I look back on, um, and yeah, it's easy. It's easy to say now. I should have done that, or I should have, could have, woulda. Um, but you know, like I said, we're all a work in progress, and so I'm trying to do it now. Um, and I don't. I don't know if the outcome would have been different. Um, I don't know. I don't. I, like I said, I, I, I hope it wouldn't have. I'm, I'm sorry, Mary, what was the second part? Uh, just and the second part is where is the happy medium? And I think, I think you have spoken to this a little bit in terms of if we do the work to make it easier to speak up in the moment, maybe we don't have to be as concerned with answering that, that second part, right? Maybe it will become the norm for people to be able to speak up in the moment without being worried about being labeled a troublemaker. Yeah, and I think I think my point earlier too, I think is an important one in that um, the people who are in a position um, to say something and, and it's more comfortable for them to say something need to, right? Had, had the senior folks in the room had my back in a way, um, and said something and been vocal, um, that would have um, 
that that might have changed my trajectory, right? In in a in a way where I thought, oh, I am at a place where, you know, I am supported and people are vocal and um maybe. Maybe maybe it would have changed what happened after the fact. But you know, where I'm sitting now, I, I think that the happy medium is people are only going to be comfortable being vocal, saying what needs to be said if they feel they're supported. And so I'm in a position now where I can be that person and I can say something. And I hope that the, the junior people in the room hear me and hear that they're supported and hear what I'm saying. And whether it's, a, like I said at the outset, male, female, black, white, any religion, um, any gender, um, you know, I, I think that it's important that the junior people hear that they have support and that there are people out there who are in a position to make change that are making the change. Uh, and I think that's what's going to be a driver. And so, um, you know, the, the, the people who are in this network now that we're creating, um, I hope will um, feel empowered and, you know, participate in the training and other things that will help all of us, and myself included, um, feel more comfortable, feel better prepared, um, whatever the case may be, to, to do that. And likewise, have the junior folks who are coming up behind us feel that same way um, and feel supported and connected. That's great. I see we have one more question here that might tie in very nicely to where we go from here, right? Because this is just the beginning. This is just the very first conversation on what I am confident is going to be an incredibly successful endeavor. Um, so we're on the precipice of change with regard to how topics such as anti-racism and gender identity are discussed, both at home and in the workplace. Within the Women's Initiative, what is your personal commitment to actively advancing these discussions and diverse viewpoints? And I can just um, encourage you, uh, Casey, to um, feel free to talk about the discussion that we had earlier in the week about being very intentional in terms of who we're inviting to present in our programs. Yeah, I, I think that um, I will be disappointed if this program um, ends up being um, a bunch of white women talking to each other, um, to be quite frank. I, 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 that is not what I, what I hope for this program. Um, what I hope for this program is that a large group of completely diverse individuals, um, diversity in every sense of the word, um, can come together and, like I said at the outset, learn, share, and connect. Um, and the way we do that is, you know, our, our, I, I think, and, ha and have it be inclusive and have it be um, make it clear that that this is the intention of the program um, is to offer training to everybody and make it clear that it's not just for women. Um, along the lines of what I said earlier, in turn, you know, we're planning to offer um, implicit bias, um, uh, anti-harassment, you know, ways to thrive and not just survive. Um, you know, career development and things, and, and all of those things are not just um, for white women, that they're, they're for everybody. Um, like I said, managing and supporting um, people, all people who are in marginalized groups it, it is important. And so the, the training element of it um, is, is going to be a big piece of this. Um, the networking piece of it, I think, um, is also going to be a big piece in finding people who you can relate to, who um, you have connections with, who you can develop relationships with is important. Um, and, and what Mary and I were talking about earlier in the week is that um, people need to see people who look like them. Um, we, I experienced this with my daughters where um, 
there, there are no women, um, there are no teachers of color at my children's school. Um, and so when my children play and they play engineer because their daddy's an engineer or they play lawyer because their mom is a lawyer, um, they never play teacher, which is an odd thing because a lot of my friends' kids all play teacher in school. And I say to them, why don't, why don't you ever, why don't you ever play school or play teacher? Um, and my almost four-year-old says to me, because there aren't any teachers that look like me. Um, and that is a problem, <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's true, right? You go into a law firm and if um, nobody looks like you, you know, do you want to be the only one? Do you want to be the trailblazer? That's not a comfortable position for a lot of people. Um, and, and that's a whole other conversation and a whole other issue that we have to work through as a legal profession. But what we can do, what we can do here with this program is we can have um, training programs that speak to everybody and that are for everybody. We can have um, people teaching those classes who um, look like different groups um, and represent different groups and bring the perspective of different groups. And that is what I hope for this program. Um, and, and that goes to the finding people you can relate to and make connections with and whose perspective is the same as yours um, or background or um, experience or situation. And that I think is really important. And I know that Mary and the Dean and, and others that are working on the nitty gritty of this program, program um, along with you know, the leadership and the council and so forth are really being very mindful about and making sure that it looks like um, it looks like everybody in some way. And so that I think will result in um, greater participation, more meaningful participation, and ultimately more meaningful change on an individual level. Um, you know, uh, that's how we're gonna drive this um, change generally. Uh, so that, that would be my hope for this program. Um, and I know that, that we're all being um, very mindful and, and paying a lot of attention to that. That's terrific. Thank you so much. Um, I think that your leadership on this is so important and, and vital and your voice is um, going to carry a lot of weight as we move this program forward. So I, I realize that I'm a little bit over time. So I want to just mention really quickly, the first program is going to be tomorrow at noon. And it's going to be given by our alum, um, Elizabeth Hoffmeister. She's going to, she has just started her own business and she's going to do a program on taking control of your career in uncertain times. And everybody here is welcome to join us. And we are also planning a summer skills building series that will start in July and last through the summer with um, input from Casey on the subject matter. And we're really excited about that. So Casey, I, Thank you so much and so sincerely for the, the leadership that you're taking here and this opportunity for all of us to be involved. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you for an hour. I am, like I said at the outset, I'm one perspective, one person. I would welcome a continuing conversation with anyone on this call who has ideas or um, thoughts or um, just wants to connect and chat. Um, uh, so, you know, feel free to, to reach out and I look forward to continuing the conversation and thank you to the school for this um, opportunity and um, for driving this program forward. I think it's going to be really great. Great. With that, everyone have a wonderful day and rest of your week. Great. Lots to do. Thank you.